tonight. Hope is a victim of child sacrifice. A horrifying new crime perverting traditional culture. They cut through the neck and cut out the throat. And the man whose mission is to see justice done. No human being should be exposed to what they see. With a little help from Australia, Wallets open, fingers crossed. Can they catch the witch doctors <laughs> who prey on young children? OK, stop everything. Yeah. The wiries called the tracker. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, we get a phone call saying the guy's back in town. Are you here? And now all we had to do was find him. I love the way you handle my situation. I love the way you fight for me. Peter Sawachiryanga certainly has a way with kids. I love the way. But behind all the silliness is the painful knowledge of how they came to be in his care. Most of the children at this rehabilitation centre are victims of child sacrifice. This is Robert, the fighter. Peter's a former accountant who became a pastor, and he started campaigning against child sacrifice almost 10 years ago. All right, one, two, three, jump. Yeah, you did it. OK, that's enough. This horrendous crime isn't the ancient ritual you might imagine. Child sacrifice is a recent phenomena. It's a recent problem uh, and mostly done by those we call witch doctors. They mutilate children and use their blood, uh, tissue or any body organs uh, with the belief that when you use those body parts into witchcraft rituals, you get wealth, you get protection, you get some form of blessing. The few who somehow survive this ordeal, like Robert, usually suffer from terrible injuries. Are you able to get on the swing by yourself? Uh, many doctors and surgeons say that based on this injury he had on his neck, he will never walk. And um, he has beat that. Robert's remarkable progress is largely thanks to surgery he received in Australia two years ago. He's one of several child sacrifice survivors who've been treated at no cost by hospitals in Brisbane and Newcastle. <laughs> but Peter's charity, Champisi Childcare Ministries, does more than rehabilitate survivors and raise awareness. It works with politicians, police, prosecutors and judges to ensure that child sacrifice doesn't go unpunished. It is not part of our culture. It has never been part of our culture. It is something that is relatively new, but growing. It's very difficult to know the scale, but the numbers we work with each year is between 20 to 25 each year of children that we have. Confirmed cases. Yes, of confirmed child cases sacrifice. each year. And those are just the numbers we know for us as a very small organization. A 10 centimeter long scar on the back of the neck will be a lifetime reminder for 11 year old Kanani Nankunda of the day his sister was killed and her organs harvested as part of human sacrifice ritual. We have a society that believes in witchcraft. The majority of the population, including the Christians who go to church, they consult these witch doctors. Widespread concern over child sacrifice in Uganda emerged around 10 years ago, following an economic boom and rapid social change. 
perhaps people saw an easy route to riches. Some witch doctors, using the cover of traditional medicine, find it all too easy to exploit the greedy and gullible, even wealthy businessmen and politicians. They manipulate the mind of their clients, and when they see that this one is interested in money, is interested in wealth and is so greedy, they'll go ahead and ask the impossible. They ask you to sacrifice a human being, and people have gone ahead to do it. They call him the miracle child. A machete was sliced through Alan's head and neck in an attempt to behead him. Back in 2012, the BBC investigated the case of Alan Sambatia. The men Alan claims kidnapped him for sacrifice live in this village. They were arrested and released without charge. Posing as businessmen with a construction project, the BBC captured shocking footage of one of the witch doctors Alan had accused. We were introduced to this man, Awali. During the first meeting, Awali sacrificed a goat to bring luck to the business. A few days later, we were invited back to his shrine to discuss what he regards as the most powerful spell, child sacrifice. There are two ways of doing this. We can bury the child alive on your construction site, or we cut the child and put their blood in a bottle of spiritual medicine. If it's a male, the whole head is cut off and his genitals. Alan Sambatia is 16 years old now, and incredibly, the men accused of attacking him continue to evade justice. His physical injuries have mostly healed, thanks to surgery he received in Australia, but the emotional scars are still raw. Somehow it is difficult to talk about what happened to me, and sometimes when I talk about it, I start crying. <coughs> Because I remember the injuries I got. I remember when I was taken. Uh, I tried to struggle to, to run. They hit me up and they did whatever they wanted. So when I think about it, I, I cry. Nenakuzomwe <laughs> Although Alan recognized his attackers, the case against the two witch doctors was dismissed at the time because the court refused to accept the testimony of a six-year-old. But Peter has never given up hope of bringing them to trial. It is interesting how a case with overwhelming evidence was kicked out of court. I think uh, uh, Alan's case in the area of justice has been the longest on my table since 2009. Two against two, right? Yeah. Peter desperately wants justice for victims of child sacrifice. But in a poor country like Uganda, that costs money. 
Luckily, he gets help from Australia. It was a long-standing ally from Brisbane who helped bring kids to Australia for surgery. And now that ally is helping fund the investigation, arrest and trial of perpetrators. Unfortunately, the, the police, the, the courts in Uganda are grossly underfunded. Many cases actually don't go to court or to trial because of lack of funding. And that's one of our biggest roles in this area, and that is financial support. Originally from South Africa, Rodney Callanan is a civil engineer who started a charity supporting vulnerable children in East Africa. He met Peter through his local church in Brisbane. The last two months we have seven cases. What? Are they yeah. deaths or attempted? Or both? Deaths. Deaths? No, no survivors. Oh, man. And uh, one particularly is uh, a case of an uh, approximately 10-year-old boy who was found uh, dumped uh, in a bush, as you can see the pictures here. Um, oh, no. It's uh, uh, the cat of the ears. They cut through the neck and cut out the, the throat. The trauma that he and his team go through, what they see is just overwhelming. No human being should be exposed to what they see. Have the bodies been obviously dismembered for sacrifice? Yeah. Body parts removed? Body parts were missing, uh, the tongue, the legs, the genitals. Ultimately, Peter knows that the only way to prevent these crimes is by chipping away at the superstitions that make them possible. He's bringing his team to the village where the latest victim was found dumped in the bush. An unidentified boy, about 10 years old. <laughs> Peter's here with Hudson, Alan's dad, to appeal for information and to raise awareness of a problem cloaked in ignorance and fear. Why we are here is we heard of a story of a child who was sacrificed here. And unfortunately, the people that kill these children are among us. If you know who killed our child, just come and tell us, call the number, we will even put a reward. Please, don't fear. If you fear, next time it will be your child. The villagers listen politely. The person who makes the biggest impression today is this man. Paul Adida is a repentant former witch doctor. He's wise to all their tricks. The villagers lap it up. I get the feeling this is very familiar to many of them. The reaction from the community sometimes is very hard to know. You know, some of them, uh, I'm pretty sure, understood the message and if out of a hundred you can get one to abandon these practices, that's a success. Right now, Peter and Rodney have some reason for hope. After nine years, there's finally been some progress in the case of Alan Sambatia. The first breakthrough came late last year.
A sympathetic judge ordered the retrial of the two witch doctors Alan had identified. Hello, Justice Logan. Good to see you. How? Yes, after a long time. Yeah. Judge Margaret Motonia is one of Peter's most important allies in the fight against child sacrifice. Since the, the judgment on Alan's case, we were able to arrest the first suspect. Peter tells her that one of the witch doctors has already been arrested and the other went on the run. But police have now tracked him down. And now, tomorrow, is the operation to arrest him and bring him to justice. That's good to hear. Yeah. That's good news. Courts in Uganda are so cash-strapped that this couldn't happen without Rodney's fundraising efforts in Australia. As a judge, I find it very frustrating because I believe in justice. Can you imagine a case where an accused person whom you very well know that killed your child or killed your brother, but because of delayed trials, he comes away scot-free? Justice Margaret, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you. God bless you. It's a pleasure. Pleasure. So, what is for you? The next morning, Peter and Rodney meet with two police detectives, whose identities we will disguise for their own protection. Please, have a seat. This afternoon, they'll all set out to capture the witch doctor accused of attacking Alan, Kiyumbi Awali. We can bury the child alive on your construction site. This is the same man who was filmed eight years ago by the BBC, offering to sacrifice a child. The whole head is cut off. We have to drive a very long way from Kampala to where he's hiding. So are we confident that we know where he is? We believe we know where he is? The police are tracking Awali's mobile phone, but two previous attempts to catch him have already failed. So he's harboring him? Yeah. Okay. They can't afford any mistakes this time. Trying to catch a witch doctor isn't cheap. I need to give you some money. Uh, 300, 100, 150? 550. He's working out all the costs that are associated with collecting those resources that we need to add now to the operation. And you guys are paying for all of that? Yes. Yeah, yeah it's part of the process is um, actually funding the operations. The wallet's open, fingers crossed. <laughs> we have a very short window to execute this. So please use all your Resources. resources and capacity to get this. We can't miss this chance. We want to bring justice to Alan. Um, we want to bring closure to, to his father. And have this guy tried and convicted and hopefully sent to jail for a very long time. Coming up, will Peter find the witch doctor accused of attacking Alan? Right now we are in a critical time. I am in a, a desperate need. All of a sudden out of the blue, we get a phone call saying the guy's back in town. And, and now all we had to do was find him. We're getting closer to where the witch doctor that allegedly attacked Alan is hiding out. We've picked up an armed escort from the local police, and we also have an undercover informer with us, someone who knows Awali and is helping us track him down. Rodney's worried we'll draw attention to ourselves. Should we stay undercover? I, mean, I don't know. Are we close to a wiry now? This is the local area where... Mm -hmm. 
kind of way to leave. I think, well, let's not blow the cover then. Yeah. Peter decides it's safe to set up a makeshift office in an old church nearby. So we have a, a printout of all the calls that uh, Awali has made and all the calls that have come to Awali. But you, maybe you should call. You should call that number because you're the area ADC. The trick is to try to find out who are these people calling him. If we can arrest one of those, those can lead us to Awali. Okay, okay stop everything. Yeah. Awari is called the tracker. The informer, sorry. The witch doctor has actually called our informer and told him that he's actually on the road traveling to Umbarara. Umbarara is five, six hours away from here. That's unfortunately not very good news at all. He's not here. Go call the police in Kamwenge to put a roadblock on the Mbarara road. We head off in pursuit of the witch doctor. So how do you feel as a, as a pastor, as a former accountant, running around the countryside doing detective work, with the police often looking to you for advice and direction? It has become part of me. And I do it because I have to do it. Or I do it because I have no choice. It's probably even confusing to my wife, because sometimes she doesn't know where I am. Or even my kids, if they ask me, what did you do today? Maybe sometime I'll find a way to describe it. It's just, you're in the jungle and sometimes I think I don't even know that you're gonna come back. Right now we're in a critical, critical time. The person giving us coordinates is not prompt. Unfortunately, we're not getting updates from the person tracking the witch doctor's phone. So we are struggling because now the suspects are moving. So we don't uh, know whether he's ahead of us or behind. This is at 1.57. Unfortunately, the intelligence was lacking. Um, information that we needed from headquarters wasn't provided. Where he was supposed to be, he wasn't there. So we just went through this absolute roller coaster. To make matters worse, Peter soon realises the police haven't set up a roadblock to catch the witch doctor. I am in a, a desperate need. I think they are fearing to communicate to Mbarara to put roadblocks. I don't know how this uh, works. They literally not getting the support. That roadblock is not able to be established. And it's probably because it's Friday afternoon, the, the policemen probably have not been paid and they've gone home. So due to lack of information, we, it's very difficult to make a decision. Unfortunately, we had almost, I suppose, given up. We're going to go home and, and this guy's going to get away for the third time now. But just as things are looking hopeless, some good news. All of a sudden, out the blue, we get a phone call saying the guy's back in town. And, and now all we had to do was find him. And through incredible, literally incredible detective work on Peter's part, not even the police, he managed to find out where he was and who to actually lead us to the house. I think we. Okay, I'm going to assume you. Assume you do. Assume you're 94. We just uh, found him uh, sleeping. And how did he react? Uh, he had no choice because uh, you know we we had we had one minute we were in front we were behind and we were, we were able to cover him up. He tried to struggle. Absolutely, yes, he tried to. Yeah, he went. He was struggling, but he he found the chase. 
What are you looking for, Peter? Artifacts. So we're just looking for artifacts, and the things that we think he uses. Okay, so get moving. So I got you. How are you feeling, Peter? Good. Great. Who wants to cry? Finally. Finally. It's Finally. been a long time coming. It's been long. We got him. <laughs> we got him. How are you feeling? Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm actually quite emotional, to be honest. It's amazing. Oh, he's bad. He's doing it. All right. Come in here. Please. Well, I have some news. On Thursday, we went to, we were tracking Awali um, from Kampala to Kayunga to Kamwenge Friday, and Friday night we arrested the Awali. <coughs> <coughs> That's good. Yes. I've been waiting for that moment. I did. So we did. We arrested him. Uh, tomorrow, Monday or Tuesday, he will appear in court. So we have him. We have both of them. The trial is going to start soon. Are you ready? Yeah. To be in court again? The wheels of justice turn slowly in Uganda, if at all. But for Alan's family, they're turning at last, thanks to the determination of Peter and his team. Hey, morning. And some generous foreigners. You too. How do you feel as a Ugandan judge about the fact that you need to rely on charity from Australia to be able to hear some of these cases? Of course, the state has the responsibility to do that. It would be absurd that it takes a foreigner to come in and do what our government is supposed to be doing. It is sad to see that we have left uh, the protection and fighting of rights for the children to charity. Because that is exactly what is happening. Ten years ago, this witch doctor allegedly attacked Alan Sambatia, the son of a childhood friend, almost killing him. <laughs> Ewan has just been arrested. Yeah, well, Ewan has just been arrested. He was indisposed for all the time. Yes, indisposed for since two nine. Chigambi bwanti chifumbi awali nenga siro chipo ngena kusome zali abiri mu mwezi wa kumi mwaka bili kumi na bili mwenda mchele kwa ita kusolo itsangi wa districti ya kayunga umaga za koko ta sembatia alan ngamusala na kaso.
For Peter, ending child sacrifice sometimes seems like a hopeless mission, and one he's risking his life for. Even his biggest supporters worry about the toll it's taking on his health and his family. Sometimes I feel like giving up, but then you hear of a case and I'm like, who is following up on this? Who is finding justice on this child's case? Uh, and then you go back into it. Uganda is beautiful. I would rather go around telling about the beauty of the children of Uganda, the beauty of the nature that is in Uganda. The child sacrifice doesn't represent Uganda. It carries shame for me as a Ugandan because, you know, this is not something that I should do, portray about Uganda. But if this will save one child, I will carry on. If you'd like to watch any of our stories, Dateline episodes are available on SBS On Demand.